Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship in God's house this morning and a special welcome to our guests as well. We hope that you can come and join us in the future too. Just a couple of announcements before we begin our worship this morning. Um, after worship, there will be Bible study. Um, we're going to be continuing our Bible study on the idols I never knew I had. And we're looking at the idol of love today. We're going to finish that one up as well. Embracing abilities, the camp is still here for this week and for next week as well. Uh, it's been working out well. It's been a wonderful way to make some contact with some family members and some children, uh, special needs children as well. So. Uh, Ladies' Aid, which would have happened last Tuesday, is actually going to happen this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. So all ladies are welcome. If, even if you're new to the group, you're welcome to come and join us for that ladies' meeting. And then there will be Bible study on, uh, at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, uh, Timely Topics, Timeless Truths. Uh, so we'll be studying more there as well. This study on Wednesday will be all about communion. Uh, the practice of close communion. Uh, is that practice something that causes others to stay away from us? Uh, does it hurt our evangelism when we practice close communion? We'll be discussing that on uh, Wednesday evening. And then elders meeting will be at 4.30 on Thursday. If there are any things that you would like to bring to the elders, um, and I think all the elders are here, would you mind just standing up for just a moment and then everybody will recognize who our elders are? Please bring any of your issues uh, to them, and uh, they might discuss them at the meeting as well. Uh, and that's always a good thing to do, to discuss those things in love. Uh, men's Breakfast and Bible Study, that will be this Saturday at 9 o'clock, followed by the council meeting with the new church council that was just installed a couple of weeks ago. All right, here are our offerings. This one's kind of an interesting uh, screen because this is the end of the fiscal year, so we see where we end with this fiscal year. And as we end with June 30th, this fiscal year, uh, as we've mentioned before, this is significant for us because um, now we are coming off of subsidy, and now um, the Wells, Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, would desire for us to be self supporting. So many prayers may be said. May we also be turning to God's word in our personal study and also in our study uh, as Christians together. Uh, there is strength as we grow in God's word together. That affects offerings as well. So uh, you are welcome to give online offerings if you're unable to be here sometime during the summer or if you have a future vacation. So thank you for remembering your offerings uh, to help support the ministry here. Uh, and then there's a picture of our new church sign that was installed almost a month ago, June 18th. Uh, thank you to those gentlemen who installed it. We'll also have a picture one of these days of the dedication of that sign, which happened the week after it was installed. All right. Any other announcements this morning? Yes, Becky. It's on the church calendar. It, I don't know if it's been changed yet. It was supposed to be on the 24th. It's been changed to the 30th. Ladies Aid will be hosting a Devonshire cream tea because I know several ladies in the congregation, including me, are Downton Abbey fans. So in conjunction with the Downton Abbey film that recently was released, we're hosting a Devonshire Cream Tea to also talk about what Ladies Aid is, what Ladies Aid isn't, things like that. We would like to know, possibly by the 24th of this month, if you'd be able to attend, if you could let me know. My daughter, Sarah, who unfortunately is not here today. Um, so I you know Fran is in Ladies Aid, uh, Carol Gibson, just let one of us know by the 24th if you'd be attending, just so we have some rough number um, uh, of ladies who would possibly be able to attend. Just so you know, a cream tea, a very nice lady in England years ago told me a cream tea is also known as a naughty tea. This is not an afternoon, what a lot of us think of as afternoon tea with the, the cucumber sandwiches and such. No, this is a very indulgent tea. Um, with, with sweets and things like that, um, just to give you a better idea of what it is. So if you feel like you don't want to attend, just let one of us know. Thanks. Thank you, Becky. We'll watch the June edition of the Wells Connection at this time.
Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Education makes a difference, not just in academic achievement, but also in developing Christian character. A powerful illustration of how education can transform lives is on display at Kingdom Prep, a new Wells Area Lutheran High School in Milwaukee. How are you? When we got started, it's hard as a new school coming into a space and just saying, okay, make us number one on your list, right? It started off with eighth grade young men coming to build a high school. And so these eighth grade young men came to Wednesday night founders groups. And they started designing one at a time uh, the mascot, the school day, what we would wear, uh, where we would go on Exploration Thursday trips. How do we create a space to be able to continue to serve kids from the city? How do we make uh, young men who are ready to be men of the kingdom? Anybody else got something that they want to say from what Mr. Spurrier was talking about when he was last up here? Cam, what you got for me, loud and proud? We now have about 200 young men, and you now have these originally eighth graders. They're now the seniors who've gotten much bigger, much stronger, uh, much more biblically centered, and they are now raising up the next generation of freshmen who will come in here next and carry on the legacy. Oh, it's an all boys school. I was already struggling in middle school because, you know, there's females distracting me. All right, I'm going to an all guys area. Think of it as a football team and everything runs smoothly. And so when we first uh, came up with the idea of an all boys school, we like brotherhood. We want to be brothers. We want to be a family. And even with our lunch, we have a family style lunch where everybody comes to sit down at the table, we have a table captain. You're gonna work with your family through the hard times, the good times, you know, the bad times. You always with your family. The next line, lazy hands make for what? Poverty. True? Apostle Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and so by doing, you fulfill the law of Christ, which is obviously to love one another. The way that we built brotherhood through Christ and God is like really important because He's like the main building block. He's where we all base ourselves around and like being able to talk to other guys about that is one of the best parts about the school. I have a group of people that I can talk to about religion or if I'm struggling, they're always there to talk to me. They'll bring up Bible verses or anything like that. We're on your game all the time and you keep on missing Bible study because you're on your phone or your game. So whatever hurts my brother hurts me. So if my brother needs help with something, I'm going to be there to help him out. We're only as strong as our weakest link, right? Uh, we're here to constantly be being able to bend over and pick a brother up. Fixing whatever traumas and things that they've experienced within themselves. Counseling is a big piece around here and how do we allow them to be able to express themselves. We live in a city where like, there's a lot of bad influences and you're not really able to be yourself. You're not able to be vulnerable. I'll preach the gospel to them, right? But I'll give them some practical wisdom in here and say, young man. I was pretty down on the situation I was in and coming here, it grew my faith with God because as I was in a low place in life, um, I went to God. Your personal mission statement should be timeless. And then the realization of, I need my Lord to get me through these tough times, and it helped a lot build my own faith. Number two, you can find truth for your life by reading God's Word. Because you know, everybody has stuff going on at home or things in general, and like being able to go to a place where you can feel comfortable and like be vulnerable, talk to people without being judged. We're preparing young men for leadership for trade school, for college, for entrepreneurship, you name it. I plan on going to culinary school. I plan on going to Northwestern Michigan. They have a really good uh, culinary program. I want to help out students. I want to help people get the things that I wasn't able to have. I love to just give back to the future generations, basically. So MLC is a school for teachers. It will help me keep my faith while I'm still up there. And two, I can still play football. All the things that I've learned, aside from academics, like all the life lessons teachers have taught me, all the good values and principles, I'm bringing out all with me as well. They're starting to recognize what does it mean to live in this kingdom first and foremost. Uh, I think it's going to pay off in big ways. I think they're going to be husbands to their wives, fathers to children, um, community leaders, certainly church 
you know, congregational leaders. It's going beyond just getting a diploma. It's beyond just the work that you pour in. But how are you intrinsically a better young man? But to be able to do a, a work from my heart and to continue to live towards his glory and everything that I do, like, you can't beat it, man. You can't beat it. Your personal mission statement will help you to maintain your family. I would dare say the first and best thing we have going for us is kingdom first, the word first, right? And after that, everything else kind of falls into place. We're doing this for Christ. And so that's where the kingdom part comes in. You know, we are doing it to serve Christ. So that's what it's all about. Kingdom Prep is four years old, which means the first class of students has become the first class of graduates heading out into the world to serve the kingdom. And overall enrollment at our Wells Lutheran Elementary Schools and area high schools is up 10% this year. A tremendous blessing that means thousands of additional children are hearing about Jesus every day. blessings that are happening there. Uh, all right. Well, we'll continue on then with our worship then this morning. We're focusing, we're focusing on one word, uh, and the word is focused for this time in the uh, Pentecost season. And today we're going to concentrate on the theme, Focused Love finds a neighbor rather than avoiding one. God bless our worship this morning as we begin with the singing of the first hymn. <laughs> Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, 
we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory be to God. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in the true faith. Provide us with all we need and keep us safe in your care. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading from God's Word this morning comes from the book of Ruth, 
Reading from chapter one. The Lord moves Ruth to share love with a neighbor, a neighbor who was her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived about ten, there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We invite you to join in the singing of Psalm 25.
Christ has freed us, he has freed us for a life of humble service and love, even love to our neighbors. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be, to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We invite you to please stand. comes from Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 25. Jesus teaches us how to love our neighbors with a well-known parable. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. 
Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, you O Christ. Christ. You may be seated as we sing the next hymn. Lord of all nations, grant me grace. and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we ponder God's word this morning, we turn to our gospel reading from Luke chapter 10. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It happened a while back that a pastor went to a prospect's house, one who had visited his church. He went to the prospect's house and that woman had started reading the Bible. The pastor during that visit heard this woman say something that is kind of interesting. She said, Pastor, the more I read the Bible, the more I realize I am not the person I thought I was. And the pastor agreed with her. Quite often when we read scripture, we get to understand through the Holy Spirit's work just how depraved and sinful and empty we truly are by nature. But the pastor also reminded her how much we need Jesus. And that's the other message we gain from scripture, the law and the gospel. It is human nature to be like this lawyer that we hear at the beginning of these words of our gospel. This lawyer knew the law of God. 
And so he wanted to test Jesus with Jesus' knowledge of the law, too. This man wanted to be justified in himself. He thought he knew the law and was fulfilling that law and did not recognize how empty he truly was. Jesus, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, being the master that he is, made the question into another question when he says, well, you tell me. You're a lawyer. You tell me what the word of God says. How do you read it? And the man began to proclaim the great Shema of the Hebrew words in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Shema meaning hear. And the words are like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he began to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The man knew the law of God. Jesus said, if you do these things, you will surely live. What the man did with the word of God is do what humans often do. They read what God demands, but they forget the motivation for why we do what we do. When you read those words from Deuteronomy or the words that this lawyer quoted, you hear about how we are to love God most of all and then love our neighbor. But did you catch the words that motivate us to love God and love our neighbor? There's a couple of phrases in there. Love the Lord your God. The Lord means the one who is free and full of compassion and grace to sinners. That Lord who promised to send his son Jesus Christ for us. This is the Lord that we long to love with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love the Lord your God. Did you notice that word God means he is the God of power and strength. But don't forget the word in front of God. He says, this is your God, the one who loves you, the one who longs to have a relationship with you. When you recognize who your God is, then we are motivated to love him. And then we are able to also be motivated to love our neighbor too. This is what the man was missing. Mankind loves to think, I can justify myself by the works that I do, and then I can get to eternal life. This is rubbish. This is what the human conscience desires and concludes, but it is wrong. The only way to eternal life is through the Lord your God. It is through Jesus Christ, your Savior, and him alone who shed his blood for you. This man, instead of turning to the Lord, his God, wanted to justify himself. He thought he was keeping the law. He thought he was loving his neighbor. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Isn't it human nature for us to do this as well, to to limit the definition of who our neighbor really is. The people I like, the people I get along with, those are the people who will be my neighbor. I think it's good for us to remember in scripture that God does not limit who our neighbor is. When you read the words that this lawyer quoted from the Old Testament, it tells us to love our neighbor But the words go on to say to also love somebody else. God in the Old Testament says, love the alien too. Love the foreigner. Love the one who is not like you, that lives near you, that is among you. Love them too. It is human nature to limit that love. Christ does not limit that love. When we think about his blood shed upon the cross, that love was not for a few, but it was for all. Forgiveness of sins was won for every person, 
God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. If they are not saved, it is they who are to be blamed. If they are saved, it is God who is to be praised alone. Love the Lord your God, for he has loved you. We have issues in our community. Yes, churches have issues too. The issue we might think about this morning is anger. There is so much anger in our communities, in our society. It is palpable. We hear of shootings, and when there isn't a shotgun or a knife involved, there are shouts. And if there are not shouts, there is anger that wells up in the heart. People are tired of people being victimized or being the victim themselves. They are facing so much injustice. And may I say this? Anger is exhausting. It takes away, it drains us of the love that God desires for us to have for one another. We are moved by God's love to repent, to recognize who our neighbor is, but not to stop there and recognize them, but then to also be a neighbor to them. Are we determined in such love for our neighbor? Do you recognize in this parable how there were two men, a priest and a Levite, people who worked in the church, and they were going along this road leading from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Here was a man who had been beaten and left by the side of the road. He had been stripped of his clothing. He had been left half dead. The priest goes by and walks by on the other side. The Levite walks by, passes by on the other side of the road. These were Jewish religious men who passed by a Jewish person, a person of their own culture. But Jesus gives us a striking example when he brings up the third person who passes by on this road. The third person is a Samaritan. And unless we know what Samaritans are, we don't fully get the picture. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. Jews saw Samaritans as dogs. If a Samaritan was to offer help to a Jew, a Jew was to say no. He was to reject that help. And yet, what does this Samaritan do? He sees this man, and he not only sees this man, he comes up to this poor, half-dead man. And not only that, Scripture tells us that he's moved with great compassion for this man. The scriptures told us in our translation, he had pity on this man. He had so much pity that he bound up the wounds of this poor half-dead man. And then he put this man on his beast of burden. And then he took this man to an inn and the innkeeper took care of this person with the money that this person, this Samaritan, had left. There's great compassion. And what an amazing, shocking story this must have been for this lawyer with whom Jesus shares this story. The lawyer was expecting Jesus to say, well, my neighbors are those people near me who are like me. And Jesus says, no, don't stop there with whom we are to love. Don't stop there in finding a neighbor to love. <clears throat> this story doesn't just teach us who our neighbor is and how to love them. This story teaches us how much we failed. We have not lived up to God's standards. God's standards are perfect standards. We have fallen short time and time again, sometimes in relationships that are most near and dear to us. We've certainly fallen short in relationships with maybe the neighbor down the street, maybe with another family member or a friend or an acquaintance. 
we are not loving people who love perfectly by nature. That's why we need Jesus. Jesus is the one who is perfectly compassionate. Jesus saw us as the ones who are left half dead. In fact, scripture says we are by nature totally dead in our sins. Jesus came with the salve and the bandages of his blood and his righteousness that restored us. Jesus won for us forgiveness of all our sins, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent sufferings and death. This is what our Savior did for us. Because of our Savior Jesus, he now reshapes and fashions us as people who do not look inward for their righteousness and their justification, but that rather look outward to him for strength, to him for love and forgiveness of our neighbors. We look to him to put away our anger as he faced the ultimate anger and wrath of God for us as he died upon the cross as our perfect savior. It's so easy for us to make excuses that we're pretty good, that we're keeping the law of God. But when you try and justify yourself, what does that do for you? It reminds you time and time again, we're failures by nature. We are nothing. We have nothing that we can give to our God. All that we have, all that we are, come from our Savior Jesus who restores us, who refreshes us, who gives us joy to live for him, to love our God, and to then also love our neighbor too. May the Lord God continue to help us to understand what it is to love. Don't limit your love. It's so easy to do, to limit the who we love. Who do we love? Well, we like to say we want to love those who deserve it. Or we like to limit how much we love. I'll love as long as it doesn't cost me too much, as long as there isn't any hardship involved. I'll love as long as they'll love me back. See how we limit that love with terrible lovelessness. May your love reflect the love of Jesus, your Savior. Who does he say to love? Not just those that you like, not just those who are like you. He says to love even your enemies. For this is what Christ did when he went to the cross. While we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. There was nothing in us that he should love us, and yet he did, and he did it full and free for us. Love like Jesus did, even to those who don't deserve your love. Show the love of Christ. And how much love are we to share? <laughs> like the Samaritan. God reshapes our hearts to be like the Samaritan, to love without thought of cost and expense. We love because Jesus first loved us, who did not count the cost, but gave the very cost of his lifeblood, his holy precious blood for us. Dear friends, may Jesus' love continue to motivate us to live in love for our God. And when we understand what it means to live for God, we will also better understand and be enlightened to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. May Jesus' holy, compassionate, selfless love ever be the driving motivation behind our love for others. We love because he first loved us. Amen.
Now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We invite you to please stand as we confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Dear God, you are love, and Jesus proved it. It was your love for us fallen sinners that sent your Son to us with the message of forgiveness and even sacrificed him on the cross for our sins. Oh, how quickly and surely the problem of man's salvation was solved when you applied your love to it. How quickly the problems of human relationships and of human want and suffering could be solved if only all would learn to love one another. Love is infectious, Lord, and none more so than yours. We ask, therefore, that you entwine our hearts in your saving love, causing it to take over completely in our lives. By your love, which is ours by faith, strike off the shackles of sin that bind us to Satan, lest we be tempted to imitate his contemptible deeds and displace the force of sin in our flesh that all too often makes us unloving and unforgiving. Lord, we are not asking for some single great work to do, but only that you would teach us to love one another, thereby imitating your great love for us. Teach us to speak kindly to those who are harsh with us. Teach us to put away thoughts of revenge. Keep us from being blind to our brother's needs and from re refusing to help them carry their burdens. Cause us to weep with those who weep and to speak comforting and encouraging words to those who need them. Make us ready and willing to visit the lonely, the sick, the dying. Have us carry to our homes, to our churches, to our schools, and to our jobs the warmth of your saving love. Let us show to those closest to us that our lives have become new because our hearts are resting on your promises. With our eyes set on the goal that is in heaven, help us live and work together in love and harmony as your ransomed people. Without love, our works are nothing but a hollow shell. Therefore, as you fill our lives with good works, adorn them with your love, a love that comes from knowing you in truth as the God of love who sacrificed your Son for us. Today in our prayers, we also remember our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for Jacqueline Copenhaver as she continues to wear a foot brace. We pray that you would bring healing to her foot. We pray for Leah Fine's baby cousin, Evelyn, and give you great thanks and praise for the successful liver transplant for this little baby. We give thanks to God for uh, your healing, and we ask that you would continue to watch over Evelyn. Also, we ask that you would comfort the donor baby's family as well. We pray for Caitlin Fogey, daughter of Adrian's daughter, who uh, was recently diagnosed with a cyst that was discovered on Caitlin's brain 
in her pituitary gland. We pray that you would watch over this teenager in her time of need. She will need surgery soon, so we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless the surgeons and the doctors and nurses entrusted with her care and bring help and healing according to your will. Give peace and patience to Caitlin and watch over her during this time of her surgery. We pray that you would also uh, be with uh, the family of Mike Lyons' nephew, uh, whose wife, Leah, recently passed away from a cerebral stroke. We pray that you would give peace and comfort to the family through the good news that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Comfort the family with the knowledge that now Leah's battle is over, that her cancer is done, and that eternal life is hers through Jesus Christ, her Savior. Uh, bless the family in their time of need. We pray for Elaine Sandine, the mother of Julie, who continues her therapy. We pray that you would continue to bless this saint with your care, especially, we ask, your great comfort for her spiritual care as she looks to you and your word for help. And finally, we pray for our local Greenwood Police Department who experienced a very difficult loss of a fellow police officer. We pray that you would uplift these soldiers, these uh, police officers to do your will. Uh, we ask that you would still their troubled hearts that may be filled with anger or guilt at this time and may they continue to serve as your representatives here on earth, taking care of our bodily needs with the protection and care that they give to us through all that they do. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. In mercy, hear our confession. We often sin. We fail to imitate your love in doing only good things to others. But this is our confidence, that we can find shelter in your love and pardon through Christ, whom your love gave to us. Yes, give us your pardon, and give us also the Holy Spirit in rich measure, that he may produce an ever greater and more constant love in us. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. God, our Father, forgive our sins and cleanse our gifts of any taint of selfishness. If our love for you begins to grow cold, give us a richer measure of the Holy Spirit to increase our faith, for it is faith that works through love. Then will our offerings also increase. 
We ask this in Jesus' name, for whose sake we desire to abound more and more in all good works. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude with a final hymn.